Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. My name is Rima Rosen. I'm the Interim Vice Principal, Research and International Relations. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Beattie Memorial Lecture for McGill Homecoming Weekend 2010. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue à la conférence commémorative Beattie, un événement annuel très cher à l'Université McGill. The Beattie Memorial Lecture dates back to 1952 when the university received a $100,000 gift from Dr. Henry Beattie to hold a public lecture series in honor of his brother, Sir Edward Beattie. Sir Edward Beattie was president of the Canadian Pacific Railway, and he also served McGill as chancellor and chair of the Board of Governors for over two decades, from 1920 to 1943. The Beattie family has had a lasting impact at McGill. In addition to student scholarships in the name of Sir Beattie, Beattie Hall is the current home of the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders. The Beattie Memorial Lecture Series was created to bring top thinkers, innovators, and leaders to the university, to advance scholarship, and to inform the broader community. Topics over the last few years have included AIDS, politics, Plato, physics, evolution, atmospheric change, urbanization, comedy, and technology. Aujourd'hui, nous avons l'honneur d'accueillir parmi nous le Dr. Muhammad Yunus, laureat de nombreux prix, dont le Prix Nobel de la Paix à 2006. Today, we continue to honor the Beattie legacy and the altruistic goals of the generous endowment as we welcome Nobel laureate Dr. Muhammad Yunus to lecture on social business, a revolutionary concept for the 21st century. I would like to thank the Days Hotel Faculty of Management and the McGill World Platform for Health and Economic Convergence for inviting Dr. Yunus to join us at McGill. Dr. Yunus is honorary chair of the McGill World Platform, an interdisciplinary initiative of the Days Hotel Faculty of Management and the Faculty of Medicine. The platform was established by Days Hotel Professor Laurette Dubé to help bridge the traditional divide between market, economy, and society a divide which has created significant challenges to sustainable economic health and to human health and well-being. The McGill World Platform is a prime example of McGill's dedication to interdisciplinary, innovative, and collaborative research and to seeking solutions for global challenges. I now call upon Chancellor Arnold Steinberg to introduce our esteemed guest. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour à tous. Thank you, Vice Principal Rosen. Let me add my welcome to all of you this morning to the Beattie Lecture and to Homecoming and Parents Weekend 2010. The Beattie Memorial Lecture, as Rima has indicated, is among the university's most prestigious annual events. Certainly, it is a keystone of this weekend of connecting with and celebrating McGill. It is also an event by which we measure the continuing greatness of our university. Some of the world's best minds come together here, and the work they do drives global change in medicine industry, business science, and the arts. It is a reflection of the privilege we enjoy as a first-class institution that we're able to welcome a speaker of such singular distinction as this year's Beattie Memorial Lecturer Nobel Prize winner, Mohammed Yunus. Known around the world as the banker to the poor, Professor Yunus was born in Chittagong in what is now Bangladesh. By the age of 22, he was lecturing in economics at Chittagong College, and at 25, he was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to study in the United States, where he earned his doctorate at Vanderbilt University. He returned to Bangladesh in 1972 to head the Department of Economics at the recently established Chittagong University. He took on the role of Director of the University's Rural Economics Program, and it was there he conceived the seemingly heretical concept of extending credit to the country's poorest citizens. The program's objectives were to end the exploitation of the poor by moneylenders, to create opportunities for self-employment in rural Bangladesh, and to promote a means of financing 
that the most disadvantaged people, primarily women in extreme poverty, could manage themselves. The result was the Grameen Bank, formally created through government legislation in 1983. Under Professor Eunice's direction, the bank offered small amounts of money to those who would never qualify for loans from traditional banks, allowing them to fund grassroots business initiatives. The success of the Grameen Bank and the concept of microcredit have changed the way we think about poverty and about the ability and willingness of the poor to help themselves. It is estimated that the advent of microcredit has helped lift as many as 100 million people out of despair of harsh poverty. As a result of this transformative contribution to world economic development, Professor Yunus and the Grameen Bank were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. The Nobel Prize, while an exalted and well-deserved honor, is only one of nearly 100 awards that Professor Yunus has received from governments and institutions everywhere in recognition of his righteous work. What now? Well, having once confounded the global business community with the idea of lending money to the poor, Mohammed Yunus is introducing an even more revolutionary concept. In two books published in 2008 and 2010, Professor Yunus promotes the idea of social business, where corporations, rather than operating solely to realize profits for distributing to investors, instead turn their energies to solving social problems. A social business enterprise covers all costs and makes revenue while at the same time achieving a social objective, such as providing safe drinking water or creating affordable housing. The positive impact of the business on people or the environment, rather than the amount of profit made in a given period, measures the success of a social business. The idea of replacing free market capitalism with businesses that benefit all mankind and may eradicate poverty entirely is truly breathtaking, extraordinary, and it is an idea that is already at work. I speak for all of us at McGill when I say that we are truly honored and humbled to have with us today this visionary thinker whose simple goal is to change the world. Please join me in welcoming the esteemed Nobel laureate, banker to the poor, and great hope to millions in need, Professor Muhammad Yunus. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great honor for me, Mr. Chancellor, to be invited to speak and give the Betty Memorial Lecture. I know you mentioned it and I've been told many times uh, <clears throat> what a prestigious lecture series this is. So I feel specially privileged to be selected for this particular occasion to give this lecture. Uh, while uh, it's a lecture series, uh, your people are usually used to the kind of lectures uh, they expect from the person. Uh, I'll be a little different than that in the way I'll be not lecturing in that sense. I'll be just t telling you what I do. <laughs> I hope uh, that will not disappoint you. Uh, I was uh, introduced uh, by the <clears throat> chancellor that I did something heretic. <laughs> I like the word heretic uh, <clears throat> in introducing lending money to the poor people. Uh, that I didn't do because I was uh, worrying about it or I was uh, uh, doing research on it. Um, it's not like the way people 
devote their time and energy in, on a particular issue uh, and then go into action for that. In my case, it's quite different. It was a quite accidental thing. I had no idea I would ever get involved with anything to, with, uh, anything to do with lending money. Uh, but I ended up uh, doing that. Uh, at, even at that time, I had no idea that uh, it would lead to anything. Uh, simply forces around it uh, pushed me into the direction which became a lifelong uh, involvement in that subject. And that circumstances in which uh, all these things happened was because of the terrible economic situation that prevailed at that time while I was teaching in Chittagong University. Uh, this was uh, mid-70s, and we were going through a terrible economic situation right after War of Liberation. Bangladesh became an independent country in 1971, end of 1971, <coughs> with a lot of devastation, a lot of uh, um, killings and uh, bloodshed. Uh, so, uh, when I came back from the States where I was teaching, and um, I see a situation which is pretty uh, terrible, and uh, it became worse as years went by, and we ended up uh, with a famine in 1974. And this is the time now I'm teaching at the university, teaching economics. Uh, when you teach economics with a lot of enthusiasm, uh, lots of uh, energy uh, as a young teacher, and you feel uh, totally confident about the validity of all the things you teach your students, and then you walk out of the classroom, you see a massive uh, famine uh, all around the country. And you start questioning yourself, uh, what good is your economics that you teach in the classroom because it has no relevance to the world outside of the classroom. So gradually you start losing faith in what you teach. Your voice becomes uh, more muffled. You, you lose your uh, uh, strength in insisting on the validity of all the things that you say to your students. And as a person, you feel very useless. Uh, useless in the sense you are not of any use to the rest of the society in, in the dire emergency that prevails around you. So out of this emptiness that you feel inside of you, you try to uh, come up with something in, a desperate, in desperation of the circumstances. So what I did, uh, since I had no other alternative uh, that, or no other options that I could find out, I thought, why don't I just walk out of the campus and be with the people right outside the campus in the village and see if I can make myself useful as a human being uh, to any one person in the village, even for a day. Uh, I don't claim that I have any special ability or a special quality that I may, my, may, may make myself useful to many people for a lot of time. So I thought one individual would be good enough for me. So that's the uh, way I kind of formulated my ambition and start walking into that village every day is trying to see what can be done. And uh, as I have been, as I started doing that, I felt uh, I started learning a lot of things which I never learned from the textbooks. And in a way, that university, uh, that uh, village uh, started appearing like a university to me because that's a real learning for me. Uh, and I started enjoying it. Yes, uh, this is at least I, I know myself, I, know, I, I can feel that I'm being useful to other people. As I was doing, I started noticing something which I never felt so directly before. This is the loan sharking in the village. <clears throat> it's uh, such a terrible thing unless you come face to face with the individual situation, <clears throat> you cannot realize it. You can see it in a movie, you can see it in a play or a, in a, a novel, 
you read it all the time about the um, torture and the inhuman behavior of loan sharks, uh, but it, this, it doesn't really uh, get into you until you see a real situation of a person who became a victim of a uh, loan shark. So seeing it very at a very close quarter, I thought um, <clears throat> I should try to understand more clearly what this is it, because right now I see it in the village, uh, the way it operates. So I made a list of people who are borrowing from the loan sharks and uh, what amount they borrowed from the loan sharks, how the loan sharks kind of uh, uh, establish their links with these people and try to squeeze everything out of them. When my list was complete, there were 42 names on the list and the total money they borrowed was $27. And I couldn't believe that people have to suffer so much for such a small amount of money. So I was in a big shock that uh, it's right there in front of me. I see uh, people have been enslaved uh, by the loan sharks just because they need a tiny little money and they happen to lend them that money. <clears throat> And suddenly it came to my mind that the uh, problem uh, is difficult, very complicated, intricate, but the solution is so simple. I can solve it right away. I don't have to wait for any consultation or any going back to my textbooks to find out how to solve it. The idea was very simple. I thought instead of loan sharks lending this $27 to 42 people, why don't I lend this $27 to 42 people? And uh, delink the people from the loan sharks. And as I came up with, an Id with that idea, I immediately acted on it. I did exactly like that. I gave the money to the people to return the money to the loan sharks so that they become free from this uh, <coughs> uh, relationship they have built between them. And it created such a sensation in the village. I didn't expect. I thought this was just one of the many tiny things I have done. This is one more tiny things. But this one kind of uh, get out of uh, proportion in terms of uh, reaction from the people. They started looking at me as I go around the village as if I have done some miracle. So I was even uh, <clears throat> kidding with me that uh, if you can become an angel with $27, <laughs> It's pretty cheap. <laughs> so I thought if I do another $27, probably I'll become a super angel. <laughs> so I thought um, if you can make so many people happy with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do more of it? So I was thinking how to do more of it because it sounded like it clicked with people's need. So that kind of pushed me in that direction. Until then, it was just one more action, that's all. And then I could have forgotten that whole thing. Uh, then I was thinking I can still give money from my pocket, but I thought I should find a way so that it becomes more institutional rather than personal. So then I thought about the bank, bank located in the campus. I said, why don't I go to the campus, uh, go to the bank and tell the manager here is an opportunity for you. You can lend very small amount of money to these people and you can become a hero for them because uh, they like it so much. And instead of going to the loan sharks, they will come to you and bank will not uh, miss anything in such a small amount of money. So I told the manager. I thought he will immediately jump at it and accept it. <laughs> <laughs> See, you laughed. <laughs> And that shows how innocent I was about banking. <laughs> I was thinking a completely different way. So I was uh, surprised that he uh, kind of shocked when I suggested that. He said, it's impossible. How can you lend money to the poor people? They, he explained in details how they are not creditworthy, how it's impossible to deal with them, uh, all kinds of things. That the more he argued, the more I argued back. But it didn't make any difference to him. He just stood with his position. 
So I didn't give up. I started talking to his senior officials in the hierarchy of the banking system, went up to whatever level I could reach out to. Everybody tells me the same thing. It cannot be done. So it went on for months, but I didn't give up. Finally, I learned something from these discussions, and I offered myself as a guarantor. I said, what about accept me as a guarantor? I become the guarantor. I sign all your papers, and I take the risk, and you give the money. This time, they couldn't quite throw me out of their windows because I spoke their language. And they saw that this time, if they reject me, I still continue to criticize them. So one way they thought, why don't they, why don't they give some money to me and it will completely flop and it, I'll never come back to them again because it didn't work. That's, they're totally confident that it don't work. So they agreed. They agreed because they know that I have to pay the money and they will be safe. And it, since I have to pay the money, I'll never come back to them again. I was happy that it, they agreed, so I took the money, gave it to people, and I came up with some simple ways to how to make people, to make it easy for people to pay back. Some very simple things. And it worked. The more it worked, the more I got very excited. I wanted to do more. And I kept on adding more people every, every round. The more it succeeded, the more bank become reluctant because they were expecting it will fail. Now it's working, and I'm taking more money. I keep on signing, I don't care where I sign, I just keep on signing. <laughs> <laughs> so they got really worried, <laughs> because they, they figured out that it will fail at one time, and there will be big money involved. So they were uh, creating a lot of problems on the way. <clears throat> then I thought, in the beginning, I had no idea what this is all about. I never did any lending at all. I had no idea how the banking works. Now it works. If the bank doesn't believe in it, I became a total believer in it. So why don't I create a separate bank for this instead of trying to persuade this bank which doesn't believe in it? Then I started a new campaign for myself to get a new bank license to create this bank. And I also insisted that there should be new law creating this bank. So it should not be created under the existing law because I felt that if we do it under existing law, sooner or later it will be pushed in the same direction the conventional banks do. Because after all, I felt that uh, law is a kind of a mold. If you create that mold, no matter what you do, once you enter that mold, you take the shape of the law that you created. So I was looking for a new mold. And it was not easy to get a law passed for something that you want to do. But I was lucky I got it through. And finally, in 1983, we got the law, and we can, became a bank by ourselves. We began in 1976. By 1983, we became a bank. And once we became a bank, we kept on expanding our work very easily, because now we know how to do the job, and uh, merrily we kept expanding. And today, after 34 years, we work all over Bangladesh. We have over 8.3 million borrowers, mostly women. 97% of them are women. And we lend tiny money for income generating activities so that they can improve their income, they get their talent, their creativity used by them. And women love it because otherwise they had never any source of uh, income. They always depended on husband's income. And uh, by depending on only husband's income, the relationship between husband and wife remains a difficult thing because he controls everything. Now that uh, she starts earning money, she has a different kind of status in the family than she previously had. And then we made sure right from the beginning the bank is owned by the borrowers. At that time we were a very small organization, so owning by the borrowers was a simple thing. But we wanted to make them the owners of the bank. Today, all these eight million plus women, they own the bank because uh, that's the way we developed it. 
So in a way, we created a bank which is completely different than the conventional banks. Conventional banks concentrate on uh, lending money to the rich. We lend money to the poorest. And in mon many countries, including Bangladesh, they lend out to the men. We concentrate on giving money to women. Conventional banks work always in the city center and ask their clients to come and talk to them. We reversed it. We made the principle that the people should not go to the bank. Banks should go to the people. So we go to meet all those 8.3 million borrowers at their doorstep to do the business. And we made it a way that it has to be done in a weekly cycle. So within one week, we meet all these 8.3 million borrowers at their doorstep in all the villages of Bangladesh. It's an amazing kind of exercise to make them do the business, get the money back, and put the money in. Uh, but it goes on. Rain, shine, flood, drought, doesn't matter. So it's a routine, it's a clockwork thing, continues. It gives a tremendous strength to this whole network of people. So if you look at Grameen Bank and uh, conventional bank, you almost feel like uh, we deliberately created rules uh, which are just the opposite of the conventional rubber banks. You can almost say that uh, whenever I needed a rule, a procedure, I kind of look at the conventional bank and I learn how they do it, and all I have to do is to do it the opposite way. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I didn't have to think anything new. <laughs> so it, it happened exactly like that. So we continued that. And then people said, well, microcredit work, this work, the, the work that we do started being described uh, as microcredit. So the new word came into the dictionary, the microcredit. It didn't exist before. And uh, let's say microcredit is a good idea. It's a, it works for the poor people, but only for the entrepreneurial poor people. So I said, I don't understand that. What do you mean by entrepreneurial poor? We are working with all the poor. Said so, no, unless they have the entrepreneurial ability, they won't be able to do that. They will not uh, succeed, they will fail. I said, look, I don't understand your idea of entrepreneurship because uh, somehow you feel that entrepreneurship is limited to some people. To me, it's complete the other way. I feel entrepreneurship is a part of being a human being. It's uh, already built into every single human being. Just because we don't see them as entrepreneurs is because uh, they have never had the opportunity to unleash that capacity. Society never gave them the opportunity to bring that capacity out. So once you provide that environment, they bring their capacity out and becomes an entrepreneur. Anyway, they didn't pay much attention to what I was saying. So I thought I should demonstrate it, show it that all people have entrepreneurial ability. So what I did about four and a half years back and I started uh, lending money to the beggars exclusively. We always did lend money to beggars, but n not focused on beggars. Among many others, beggars are also Grameen Bank borrowers. But this time we made a separate program. This is absolutely dedicated to the beggars. And what we do, we go to the beggars, talk to them, and give them an idea that as you go from house to house begging, would you like to take some merchandise with you? some cookies, some candies, some sweets, whatever, some toys for the kids. And we make it sound very simple. We tell them, look, you are going there anyway. It's not extra work for you. <laughs> <laughs> they love the idea. We said, look, you give people more options. <laughs> Whether to give you something, some food to eat, some money to eat, uh, free as a charity because you're poor, which you do anyway. Now you'll say, would you like to buy something from me and show what you got? And maybe she will like it or he will like it and buy something from you. So you can do either, they can give you either some money or f f uh, food or buy something from you or do both. No, fa no problem. They understood the whole issue. 
and they started taking, I said, we give you a loan to buy all this stuff so that you can uh, take it and sell it and make money. And I thought there will be about 1,000 or 2,000 beggars in that program, and we'll find out whether they really have this entrepreneurial capacity to, <coughs> excuse me, to see that uh, even beggars have that capacity. It became so popular. Soon we have over 100,000 beggars in that program. That's it. I was amazed that they were coming up, and our staff enjoyed it very much. They were so happy to see a beggar taking money and getting into business. And we didn't train them or anything, just explain to them, this is what you can do, and find out what people like and sell it. And we made it very simple for them. We said there is no interest on your loan, so that this money will never grow, no matter how long it takes. And then we told them there is no time limit on your loan. So nobody can tell you that you became a defaulter. Isn't it? Defaulter is a bad word in, in banking. <laughs> so nobody can blame you that you're a defaulter because you have no time limit. You can just spend the rest of your life not paying back. It's still as good a client as anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so our staff became very happy because they don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Otherwise, they worry whether the says, no, don't worry about it. Let's give it to her. And if you pay us back anytime, whenever you feel like, you'll take more money. You can you get, get more money to continue and expand. Today, all these borrowers, all those beggars that join, they are on second loan, third loan, and fourth loans, meaning they're paying back without having any restriction whatsoever. More than 20,000 beggars now got out of begging completely. They became door-to-door -door salesperson. And my colleagues worry what, how long will it take for the rest of the beggars to come out of begging. I said, look, don't pressure them. They are now part-time beggars. <laughs> because they are mixing begging and selling at the same time. <laughs> they even know which house is good for begging, <laughs> which house is good for selling. I tell them that, look, they do, didn't go to the Harvard Business School, <laughs> but they understood the market segmentation, <laughs> how to play your game. <laughs> I said, don't get too anxious about it. After all, they are trying. And begging is their core business. You don't close down your core business overnight. <laughs> you have to be absolutely sure that your core business can be now given up, a new business has developed. So they are developing their sales division. <laughs> and soon they will come up to it. And it's really happening that way. So I give this example because it, it again shows you something, the capacity of individual being. We kind of neglect people. They all they don't have capacity in something. We have to take care of them. Sometimes taking care becomes so obsessive that you destroy them. It's not a good idea at all. You take care to make sure they can take care of themselves, not take care for the sake of take care. That's a destruction. So I'll come back to that subject later on, but uh, this is uh, something that we felt very good. And we, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that uh, children of Grameen families do not remain illiterate like their parents. So we wanted to make sure 100% of the children go to school right from the beginning. And it became a tradition, a culture of Grameen Bank that all the children be in school. And our staff made sure that it is done. So it's not simply, it's lending money, collecting it back. It's a kind of taking responsibility of the family and their children. So we saw the children in school, they are moving and they didn't stop at primary education. They continued to high school and many started coming into the higher education. Then higher education became difficult because their parents cannot pay for all this higher education. So we immediately introduced education loans and education loans take them 
to the higher education. So thousands and thousands of students get into higher education because Grameen Bank provides all the loans to support their maintenance, tuitions, and books, and whatever they need. Today, there are more than 52,000 students in medical schools, engineering schools, universities. So you have a completely new generation coming out of them. So we want to make a break of the traditional cycle of poverty, which continues illiteracy, lack of jobs, lack of income, and lack of health. So we want to make a break that uh, this generation be the last generation in that cycle. A new generation which is coming out of them will be completely new people, creating a new cycle, taking them forward in a new life, in a new direction. And if you go and see them, you cannot but conclude that uh, there is nothing wrong with these poor people that you work with. They are as good human beings as anybody else. Simply, society never gave them a chance to them. When you see an illiterate mother standing next to her daughter, who is a medical doctor, or a son who is an engineer, you cannot avoid asking you the question or thinking about this idea that her mother could have been a doctor too, but she never had the opportunity to go to even to school, forget about being a doctor. She never learned how to read and write. Is it her fault? Or is it somebody else's fault? She has the same capacity, or maybe more capacity than her mother, her daughter. Her daughter became a doctor, but she remained an illiterate person. So I kind of extend that idea by saying that poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we have built. So if you were in order to take people out of poverty, not only you have to work with the poor people providing these opportunities, also you have to work with the system to change. Because as long as you keep the system as it is, it will keep on creating poverty. Unless you kind of close down that faucet which brings out this poverty, poverty cannot be eliminated. You eliminate one, they create two. So we have to go back to the system how to fix that so that nobody will be a poor person. Poverty is not in the person. Poverty is imposed on the person externally. If it is external imposition, so we have to lock it up. Where is it coming from so that it doesn't come from outside? And I just gave you this long story about Grameen Bank for the simple reason after 34 years of our work, still conventional banks have not changed. You go to them, they will say the same thing, poor and not credit worthy. Whereas the whole world is beaming with people now who take this loan called microcredit. It's not Bangladeshi phenomenon anymore. It's a global phenomenon. They pay you back much better than anybody else. Our repayment rate, despite our difficulties in Bangladesh about floods and disasters and so on, never faltered, it continued. And Bangladesh is known as a country of disasters. And when disaster happens, these are the poor people who are the front line of this disaster, lose everything. Grameen Bank didn't close down because of that. Grameen Bank flourished, Grameen Bank continued, because we kind of built it up in a way that we absorb the disaster and help people overcome the disaster. And it continues that way. It's a funny thing happened because we started, again, it's a long story, but I'll not, I'll not go into it. We started a program in New York City in 2008 in uh, Queens, called it Grameen America. Because we had challenged that Grameen cannot be replicated in a situation like the United States, which is a rich country, welfare system, and so on and so forth. And people are not looking for tiny money, they are looking for big money. I said, that's what you think. If you go deep into it, you'll see completely different. So they said, why don't you show us that it can be done in a Grameen way? So we took that challenge, they provided us the money, and we started it in 2008. And we repeated exactly the same thing we do in the villages of Bangladesh. Nothing changed. We actually sent some people from Bangladesh to run the program. 
and they've never been to the United States in their life. They are very worried when they're coming, said, what do we do? We don't know anything about America. I said, that's your advantage. <laughs> You just do what you do in Bangladesh, blindly. Don't even think that you are in America. And they did exactly that, and it worked beautifully. The funny thing was, we started in January 2008. But later half of the year, the financial crisis came. And very strange situations started revealing. Big banks, huge banks, collapsing, melting away. Whereas this tiny bank with tiny loans flourishing in the same neighborhood. And I said to one of the journalists, I said, you should have asked me now, who is credit worthy? Because 34 years back, you told me that the pure, pure, poor people are not credit worthy. Now tell me who are credit worthy. Because it's the big rich people who are not paying back. It's the poor people in your same neighborhood are paying back 100% with no collateral, nothing. But it's still, system doesn't change. And that system denies access to more than half the population of the world, probably two thirds of the population of the world. And when that is not available, this service is not available, <clears throat> they have hardly taken a step to, to move forward. When the big, big banks started collapsing, bank, government has to come forward to bail them out because their argument is they are too big to fail. Meaning that if they fail, the privileged people will lose all this opportunity to continue with their life. It will create financial crisis and economic crisis. But for two thirds of the world people, banks do not exist. Not the question of collapsing, they do not exist. We don't worry about it. We leave them to pay their loan people. They can go to the pay their loan, pay, 500% interest, 1,000% interest, 1,500% interest. Who cares? And that becomes a trillion dollar industry. We don't, do, don't worry about it. Pawn shops flourishes everywhere. We don't care about it. So that is where the system goes wrong. You don't apply your talent, your creativity, to create a system we can embrace everybody. Everybody has to get into the system. Then I talk about the concept of business itself. I said the whole concept of business is also grossly mistaken because economists misinterpreted human beings. Economists imagined all human beings are just money-making machines, nothing else. All they do in their lifetime make money. And that's the goal of their life. That doesn't sound like a human condition, a human desire. It's artificially created by the theory that we built. So we are trying to fit into the theory rather than theory fitting into us. Because human being is much bigger than just being money making machine. We are not robots. We have many more dimensions than the simple selfish dimensions which we are given recognition for within economics. I said we are selfish, but at the same time we are selfless too. These both things coexist in, our, in all of us. So there are no two kinds of people. One is selfish kind of people and the selfless kind of people. The same people have exactly the same thing in us as anybody else. But the economists do not want to recognize that selfless part. They almost tell us that if you want to be selfless, walk outside of economics, become a philanthropist, give away your money if you want to be so charitable, help other people. I said, why should I? Why should we call the economics a social science if he if that cannot accommodate me as a whole, takes only a piece of me and builds a whole theory, they say, you do it this way. I said, that doesn't make sense. And all the trouble, all the problems that we created around us came from that misinterpretation. 
if I kept saying this financial crisis, along with all the crises we have, the crisis, environmental crisis, and the energy crisis, and all the social crises, is all a manifestation of a fundamental flaw in the framework of theory that we practice. Unless we eliminate that flaw, we'll keep on bumping into this problem and the crisis will become bigger and bigger. So I started creating some businesses on my own, not because I was thinking that way. On my own, I was creating many businesses which now looks like based on that selflessness that I was talking about. Then I, people kept me asking that question. Then I realized, yeah, this is the different kind of business. Over time, I created over 40 such companies. In none of these companies, I own any share. I don't have a shareholder. I created them. They become large companies. But I don't own one share. Because every time I see a problem, I create a business to solve that problem. And as there are many problems, I created many businesses. One I created uh, became uh, quite big. Many of them became quite big. One I just particularly mentioned is called Gramin Shokti or Gramin Energy. We give, uh, we sell solar home system because Bangladesh doesn't have much electricity. 70% of the people have no access to electricity. So we thought this is an opportunity to bring solar energy before the fossil fuel electricity come in. So we started that. It was an expensive thing. We, people said it cannot be done in the villages of Bangladesh. Too expensive for them. But we came out with a business model which will be attractive for them. And instead of paying upfront, we said you can pay in this monthly installment over two years or three years so that it becomes easy for you. So we started selling it. We started selling five solar home system a month, 10 solar home system a month. We wanted to get to the 100 solar home system a month. Now we came to a stage where we sell more than 1,000 solar home system per day. So it's a huge big thing. And we need so much solar panels from countries like Japan and Germany, and China. We keep buying them because people are asking for more and more solar home system. So now we decided to set up a whole factory to produce solar panel itself so that we can make it cheaper as a social business. So all these businesses relate to that kind of business that I'm talking about, not for making money, but for solving problem. And it's so based on that selflessness part of ours, all of us. So I call it social business, and I gave you an example of that. And it's much better than charity. I could have given this solar home system as a free system, and I have to go to the donor. Every time I give a solar home system, I need $300, somebody to donate me so that I can give a solar home system free. So how many solar home system could I have given? Five, 10, 100, 2,000? That's all. Donors say, OK, you stop it. I can't give you more money to, for free distribution of solar home system. Because in charity, money goes, it doesn't come back. So you are limited by the amount people you can raise funds. Fundraising is a very torturous work, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> in many organizations who are, who are engaged in charity work, they do wonderful work. They are very dedicated people. Their frustration is their whole organization devote 80% of their time fundraising and only 20% of their time in doing the actual job because, and sometimes it more, gets more difficult to get this money. Donors become reluctant and they ask 101 questions. I said, this is important, charity is important, but if you can convert some of this charity work into a business format, then it runs by itself. It, it creates its own fuel all the time and continues. And that is the solar energy thing that we are talking about. Here, I don't have to worry about money because people are paying. The more money get paid back, I buy more and sell more. And people improve. In the meantime, I try to reduce the cost so that I can sell it to more people who didn't afford before. So that is the beauty of so, uh, social business, that you can keep it as a way that it keeps running. In charity, money doesn't come back. But in social business, money recycles all the time. 
You created a machine which runs by itself. You don't have to bring fuel from outside anymore. So this is what I've been talking about. And I created a lot of these social businesses. One of them uh, was with a big multinational company, Danone. We created Grameen Danone Social Business Company to produce yogurt. This is to address the problem of malnutrition among the children. We put all the micronutrients which are missing in the children into this yogurt. Vitamin, iron, zinc, iodine, and everything. And sell it very cheap so that poor people, their children can afford it. When the children eat this yogurt, they gradually get back that malnut uh, their nutrition and become a healthy child. And today is a very successful company in Bangladesh. We are exp expanding our business. So since it's a social business, expanding business is not difficult. What we do, we go to the bank, borrow money, invest it, or find new investors, or same investors, put the money, invest, and continue. And we created other companies, like a joint venture with BSF. BSF is a chemical company, a German company. What we did, a Grameen BSF company, to produce mosquito net, treated mosquito net, so that people can sleep under the mosquito, and the mosquitoes cannot <coughs> bite them, protect themselves from uh, malaria. Bangladesh is a malaria country. At least some part of it. And the dengue fever. So make it very cheap. In the social business, you don't want to make money. All you want to do is to stop malaria, that's all. So you're devoted to the cause, and you continue. We have another one with social business, big company social business, is a joint venture with Adidas. I challenged the company CEO that um, as a shoe company, it's their responsibility to produce shoes affordable to even to the poorest person. And their goal should be nobody in the world should go without shoes. Nobody should be barefoot. They took that challenge made a joint venture with us, Grameen Aditas. And they asked me how cheap the sh shoes should be in order to be affordable to the poorest people. I said, maybe under one euro. They were shocked. How can you produce Adidas or Reebok shoes under one euro? But they didn't give up. They worked and worked and finally found a formula to produce it. It's a good, attractive lo looking shoes under one euro, so that everybody in Bangladesh can afford shoes, every child, every woman, every man. Because people suffer from many diseases, parasitic diseases, because you go barefoot. So if you afford shoes, you protect yourself from all those hookworms and all the parasites in your body. So this is a health intervention itself. Just for one euro, you get decent shoes, very durable shoes, and so on. So we had lots of these companies, I will not go on listing them, but this is an idea that it can solve any problem. People ask me, can we design social businesses for any kind of problem? I said, of course, any social problem. You can, it's a question of creativity, how you put your mind. The moment you put your mind into it, you'll come up with some solution. But today we don't put our mind. And we are very privileged in the world that we have the most powerful technology to change the world today. We kind of hold in our hand the powerful technology the world have never seen before. And it happens every day. Every day it's become more powerful. Imagine what different things happened in the last 10 years in our life. When I was a student, Xerox machine was the biggest thing. So Xerox, you have to copy it. Probably you have not seen that unless you are of my age. Then when the fax machine came, it is the miracle of the miracle. Bangladesh government immediately issued that you have to get a government license to buy a fax machine. It's so important. And that fax machine today in every home, with the, every computer, every, every telephone. So mobile phone was such a miracle. In 1995, there was only half a million telephone in Bangladesh, landline line phones. We created a phone company called Grameen Phone, mobile phone company, to bring phone in the hands of the poor people. Everybody shocked. How can poor people have telephone? What are they going to do with it? <laughs> in 
even the regulators who will be issuing license to us when we applied for license to create this company, they asked us, you, you want to give this phone to the poor women? I said, yes. Who is she going to call? <laughs> I said, no, she's not going to call, but people will call using her phone. This will be her business. She will be selling the yet time to the people in the village and make money. So it's impossible. This woman is illiterate woman. She doesn't know how to, how the numbers are read. I said, you misunderstand them. There are only 10 numbers in the world. <laughs> if pushing them, these 10 numbers, bring money, she would learn it in 10 minutes. <laughs> when I first gave them, and I got the license and started this Grameen phone, and with enthusiasm, we expanded our network to the village first, before the city, to bring phone in the hands of the poor women. Grameen Bank gave her a loan. She picked up a phone. She started selling the phone service because phone, phone service doesn't exist in the village. So she is the, has the only phone. Everybody has to line up in front of her house to make a phone call. And she was enjoying that. So after six months, I went around meet all these women who took the phone first the first time to see if they have understood how to run this business, they were bubbling with enthusiasm. So I asked someone, I said, do you have any difficulty in uh, dialing these numbers? I remembered what I had to go through. She said, no problem. I know everything. I said, do you want me to uh, call somebody? Let, give me your number. I'll call you. I said, no, it's okay. You know that. Another woman stood up. She said, you didn't give her a number. You gave the number to me. And I'll dial it. And before I dial it, blindfold me. <laughs> if I cannot dial it, blindfold it. Take my phone back. I'm not worth it. I was stunned. I cannot believe this illiterate woman challenging me, saying, blindfold me. And if I cannot dial it, blindfold it, I'll return your telephone. I wish that bureaucrat who was sitting on that regulatory agency was there. How easy to underestimate the capacity of people just because you are somewhere else. So people have that capacity. Simply, we are not unleashing that capacity. So social business is a way to expand that. It could be addressed to any kind of this. Technology makes us powerful. We can do that. We can create enormous varieties of social businesses. Taking people out of welfare could be a wonderful social business. Putting people in welfare is a very important thing, but keeping them is totally unacceptable. They are there, but we must make efforts so that they become full citizens of the country rather than depend on charity of the government, on charity of the other taxpayers. And I was exposed to this situation very drastically in Glasgow, uh, while I was speaking there, and I was told that there are thousands of families in Glasgow who are in fourth generation unemployment. I couldn't believe that in a civilized society you can have fourth generation unemployment because you are condemning those people into a situation where they lost all their human capacity. I said that the responsibility of any society is to make sure Every human being, every citizen has the capacity to unleash the energy, unleash the creativity, creativity they have. Every human being is packed with unlimited capacity. To ask them to not to use that capacity is criminal. So I said, why don't we create some social business to take these people out of that prison that you created for them? And I'm sure in welfare system, this problem is not unknown. But I'm saying welfare is only part one of the solution to help people to overcome their problem. But the part two is the most important part to get them out of welfare situation. So this is, has to be done. So we continued that. We created a nursing college in Bangladesh because we saw the need for nurses in Bangladesh and outside is so tremendous. I say young girls are sitting around in the villages getting married, having children, nothing else to do. Why don't you pick up these girls Put it in a nursing college, a decent nursing college, give them world-class 
nursing education. So they become important citizens of the world, deliver health services. So we take the students, uh, girls from the Grameen families, they are the poorest families, who went to school because of Grameen Bank. Now we take them to the nursing college. Grameen Bank gives the education loan to them. They pay the tuition for the nursing college. So the nursing college covers all its cost and give them the world-class education. And they find jobs in Bangladesh, elsewhere, and get become part of this uh, whole uh, healthcare system. And here, as was yesterday, we day before yesterday, signed an agreement with McGill University. I'm very grateful to McGill University to have a collaboration between Grameen and McGill University. One of the things that will be going through this agreement that will be pro creating a Grameen McGill Nursing College in Bangladesh. And we'll have such mercy. We can, we can create those nurse, nurses out of these girls who can compete with anybody anywhere. But the capacity-wise, they have lacked nothing. Simply, facilities are not given. So we're creating this facility, and that's why we join hands together, because McGill University has that capacity, world-class capacity. The whole world knows about McGill University and their healthcare system and their nursing colleges. So we want to take, bring that knowledge to them so that they become part of this whole uh, high-class education, and they will be different people. There's nothing wrong in them. Simply, they didn't have the opportunity. So we can create many of these opportunities around, and every single individual can do that. It's not Danone, it's not BSF, it's not Adidas who can do that. Every single individual can create a small social business to help five persons. That's what I, my beginning was to help those people with it for $27. And that's what changed everything that I do and create this whole idea. So anybody just want to solve this particular specific problem can, be done, can do in a social business way. Not to create a business to make money for themselves. They can earn money for other businesses. At the same time, they can do this social business. And it's a question of creative ideas to come. If we bring social businesses, creative ideas, technologies, nobody should remain a poor person. And there's no reason to be, because it's not part of a being, human, human being. So we look forward to a day very soon when we could put poverty in the museum, take out from the society. There'll be nobody in the world who will be a poor person. If you want to see a poor person, you'll have to go to the museum to see them. Thank you very much. So deserving, so deserving. Professor Yunus, as president of the Alumni Association, I have the great honor to thank you for your incredible, thought-provoking presentation. But as you said at the beginning, it wasn't really a presentation. It was just telling the story of what you do. Having the power to invoke change is phenomenal. And understanding people as you do is an inspiration to us all. You've compelled us to reconsider what social business can accomplish. Indeed, the notion of applying a proven business model to social problems might at one time have seemed far-fetched, giving society a chance, changing the old cycle of poverty, creating a business to solve problems. But of course, the same was said of the microcredit concept and the success of the Grameen Bank. 
proved its worth to even the most skeptical among us. So thank you again, Professor Eunice. I wish we had more time with you today, but uh, we'll now introduce Carl Moore, who's going to come up. You'll have a chance for uh, a question-answer period, which I'm sure uh, you're looking forward to. So Carl Moore is joining us on the stage here. I would, um, he's going to be the moderator for this morning's question period. Professor Moore is fairly remarkable himself, actually. <laughs> he holds joint appointments in McGill's Des Hotels Faculty of Management and the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery. He is the author of dozens of journal articles and several books, and he has written widely on leadership and business strategy. Before joining the Academy, he worked for 12 years in sales and marketing positions for such high-tech industry titans as IBM, Bull, and Hitachi. These days, he lends his considerable business expertise to firms like Nokia, Morgan Stanley, HP, and Pfizer, just to name a few, for whom he is a consultant. He also contributes a weekly video cast in his spare time to the Globe and Mail. <laughs> I'm nearly finished. Come on back up, please. It's more, which you can see on the McGill website, interviewing high profile CEOs and business prof professors. So please join me in welcoming Professor Carl Moore. Sorry. Sorry, one of my duties I have forgotten, and that's to present Professor Eunice with a gift from all of us. Thank you, Cynthia. And unfortunately, no time for questions because of the in lengthy introduction of myself. <laughs> So uh, seriously, there's two microphones here, so uh, if you could come down and approach the mics, uh, it'd be delightful to hear questions from the audience and uh, follow up on a wonderful lecture. So uh, perhaps we'll start at the front here. Hi. Um, Professor Yunus, banks are getting more and more interested in microcredit. Uh, we've been reading for the last year about a lot of businesses they want to do in microcredit. How do you see it? Does that get you worried? And where will that lead us if banks get into microcredit? Well, I was always inviting banks to join into the microcredit. Uh, so I cannot uh, say that they are, they're doing uh, bad things. But the only thing I warned that uh, microcredit always has to be seen from the social point of view. Uh, so near about the social business. We try to run uh, microcredit in the social business level. So there's not the profit-making motive which brings you to the microcredit. Uh, some banks are doing that. They want to make money out of the microcredit. Uh, so it's not a kind of service you want to provide to the poor people to help them get out of poverty, but rather to make money. And we have very extreme cases in that where they want to make enormous amount of money. And they have done that already, and we have been very critical of that. We tell them that this is something we do, don't deserve to be called microcredit. Microcredit is about helping people in a business way, uh, not as an opportunity to, to make money out of the poor people. If we call those banks who make enormous amount of money uh, by doing microcredit, then we have to p call payday lenders also microcredit because uh, they lend money to the poor people but then charge 1,500% interest. So, that, so there should be a line drawn up to where you can go, and from that red line, if you cross, then you are no longer microcredit. You can call yourself anything you want, but please don't use the word microcredit and confuse people. Thank you very much. <laughs> professor, professor Yunus, I have uh, two questions about men in okay. Bangladesh. If men have quite a bit of power, uh, to what extent uh, are the women still under men's control, even though they may receive microcredit or participate in social business? And the second question is, uh, men in Bangladesh mu must have quite a few problems with 
unemployment and lack of business and lack of education, to what extent can micro lending and social business help the men with those problems? Yeah. The number one, uh, we do lend money to men. We do not deny money. <laughs> so women become the representative of the family. She deals with the bank. She owns the bank. Mm -hmm. But the facilities of the bank are available to all the members of the family. So husband included. She borrows money for her husband's business. Lots of them uh, do big investments in uh, like buying equipments, buying uh, vehicles, who, who are traditionally, for example, one common thing for men, those who are drivers, who has worked as a driver, uh, as a micro, uh, as a mini bus driver, truck driver, or even um, a baby taxi or a three-wheeler driver. So the first, their first thing is, I've been a driver for the last 15 years. Can the bank give me a loan to buy myself a micro bus or buy myself a mini truck or a full bus? And bank willingly does that, so there's no problem. But it is through the woman. That's the only thing we make uh, requirement. So this is not a denial to that. And about the men and um, unemployment, education, when we give loans, we give uh, all loans to both men and women among the children. So they are all coming to higher education. And we, our regret is only the boys go to the higher education. Very few coming girls coming to the higher education. That's why we're trying to g build all these nursing colleges, another which is specialized for girls, because girls kind of stopped by their families when they go into higher education. Uh, very few compared to m male uh, students who go into it. And then we are encouraging to become entrepreneurs. We say we make them uh, uh, take a uh, pledge that we are not job seekers. We are job givers. So right from the education type, they will be always thinking that my responsibility is to create jobs. So, so that they do not think in terms of where am I going to get a job? Because they have money behind them to the Grameen Bank. So there, there's no discrimination in that sense. We feel unhappy about something, which as I said, women are not coming, girls are not coming forward, and we are encouraging them to come forward. But definitely it's open to all of them. Hello, Dr. Yunus. Uh, you've faced in your career several challenges and you've overcome them quite inspirationally. What I'd be interested in knowing is what is the most difficult lesson you had to learn and how did that impact your career and your life in general? The one most difficult part probably, I would say, is the mindset of people. Because people go through a certain preparation in their life, in their student life or in their, uh, their business life. And they formulate their mind what this world about and what they would do, what institutions can do. Well, for example, I had difficulty, tremendous amount of difficulty with the bankers. They cannot believe that you can lend money to the poor people, number one. They cannot believe that you can lend money without collateral. They got shocked. How can you do that? Even with collateral, we have so much difficulty getting our money back. You just give it to them, not ask for anything. Are you sure? They will pay you back? I said, they do it every day. So, do you have a good sleep at night? Give. Because in Grameen Bank, we lend out over $100 million a month. It's a lot of money to give, lend out. And we don't feel threatened that, oh, this, what happens if, it doesn't, if this money doesn't come back? That question never enters our mind. And that's the only question enters the mind of a banker. That, oh, something is going wrong. So mindset, and you know, now I'm talking about social business. <laughs> People find it very difficult. How can you run a business without making money? What kind of business is that? Because we always train to think in terms of money-making business. I said, all of us are fitted with money-making glasses as we go along in our school, in our colleges. They're all training you how to make money. So we cannot think, we cannot see something without making money. So I said, why don't you take off your glasses? You see the world as it is. And per perhaps you can put on the social business glasses, then the whole world will look so different, so exciting. I can change the world, it's within my capacity. And a fantastic capacity that I feel inside of me, I can make an impact in people's life. And I can, I, I'll enjoy that. It's not somebody pushing me to do that, because I enjoy it. Making money is an enjoyment. Changing life of other people is much more enjoyment than making money. Once you do that, then you'll realize which happiness you want to do more. Both happiness is at your disposal. It's a choice that you have to make. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Professor Yunus, 
despite the enormous success of your ideas, Bangladesh remains one of the poorest countries in the world. Why aren't the politicians and the businessmen of Bangladesh following up on your great success? Well, uh, one, just a quick explanation is a previous question. Mindset takes time. Another one, Bangladesh doing pretty good. I mean, there are a lot of poor people. Bangladesh is a big country in terms of number of people. We are 160 million people. But Bangladesh is one of the lucky countries today who will be achieving all the eight millennium development goals in, by 2015. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a tiny piece of news. It's a big news for celebration. We are on the way and we're very much on track to reduce poverty by half by 2015. So it's a big news because Bangladesh started as the poorest country in the world. So to reduce that poverty by half is a great, great achievement, accomplishment for Bangladesh. And we are on the way. We just had the Millennium Summit in the United Nations. And Bangladesh was celebrated as one of those lucky countries, fortunate countries, who will be achieving all the eight Millennium Development Goals. So we are slightly behind in two goals on uh, maternal deaths and others. Uh, but we can catch up in the next five years. That's an attempt that we are making how to save metan our health care as a social business and so on, putting all our energy together to achieve that. So that, I would say, is something. And in Bangladesh, we are in the discussion. Follow-up of the 2015. After 2015, what would be our goal? We are saying we want to bring poverty to zero by 2030 so that Bangladesh can become one country where there will be nobody will be a poor person in Bangladesh. So that is the kind of goal that you set, you work for it, and make it happen. And all these things together can make it happen. We'll, very, we'll be very close to achieving that, if not in 2030, maybe 2031, so that we can make it zero poverty. So we are poor, but we are in the way direction. And our economy is growing pretty good, 6%, uh, 7%, even during the uh, financial crisis. So that way it's not bad either. We have, we, as I said, it's a disaster prone country. It's a land of con uh, disaster. Despite all those disasters, despite all our problems, uh, the progresses are very significant. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dr. Yunus. I just have one thing struck my curiosity, uh, got me curious. Did you receive any resistance from people wanting to use microcredit? Mm, no, not resistant okay. because of microcredit as such. People have hesitation, difficulty in accepting microcredit because first resistance came we, because we gave loan to women. Men didn't like it. <laughs> Very natural reaction. Because it traditionally, he, men in the family, the husband felt threatened because I'm giving loan to his wife. So he feels that his authority is being undercut. Uh, so he opposed it. And he also felt that his wife has no experience of any handling money. He, she will make a disaster and he has to pay it back now. We had to assure a thousand times that we'll never come to you if she fails. It's between us and her. We'll work it out uh, together. But you don't have to worry about being able, uh, compelled to pay back her loan. So this is another one. Another reason uh, uh, we were opposed, uh, religious people interpreted that it is against religion because we are giving money to women. Actually, it's a male issue. It's uh, clothes in a, in a uh, religious way, the giving money to women. Uh, so we had a big kind of uh, confrontation with the religious people. Uh, but luckily, we could argue it well. Uh, it worked. We said, look, uh, the prophet of Islam, uh, he married a businesswoman. <laughs> <laughs> no, not only he married a, a businesswoman, first he worked under her. <laughs> she took a job. <laughs> she, could, she took a job under her. Later, he married her. I said, if you want to be a good Muslim, <laughs> you have to follow the footsteps of the great prophet. <laughs> and you have to marry a businesswoman. <laughs> and if you can't find one, come to us. <laughs> <laughs> we have plenty of them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yunus, I'm uh, from Congo DRC, which is a post-conflict zone. 
And I would like to know if you know about an initiative which would be able to help the women there because they're excluded, you know, because of rape, uh, poverty. So we're really looking to have um, a way, you know, finding a program that would work in past conflict zone like Congo DRC for women. Yeah. Uh, in Africa, there are lots of microcredit program, including uh, Congo. Uh, we just had a microcredit summit in Nairobi uh, this year, the beginning of this year. So all those uh, microcredit around Africa came to Nairobi to discuss their problems. But there are small programs. Definitely it needs a much robust programs in Congo. It's a conflict zone. And uh, Bangladesh is very much present through the peacekeeping force in, Bangladesh, in Congo. Uh, so we are familiar with some of the circumstances. Uh, but we'll be delighted to be of any help in any, any way to do that. We work in Zambia. Uh, Zambia has a Grameen program run by us and it works beautifully. We're doing it for the last six years uh, and we do that. So gradually, hopefully, we can uh, come around. And so how can we get in touch with you? One year I'll let you know. I'll give you my card and get okay. in touch. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Yanez. Uh, I'm an international student from Indonesia, which is also a developing country like Bangladesh. And we have 15 to 20 percent of the population amount to 20 million people living under the poverty line. And what I found out is that uh, some of the pe people coming from poor families, they have like, this kind of mentality, uh, a fixed mindset, full of acceptance of their current condition, making a living by begging uh, at the sidewalk or like at, at the traffic light or to the extreme, they do crime to make their living to survive. So uh, I believe, like you said, entrepreneurship is part of us as a human being, but how can we as a, as a part of society make a change in their mentality so that they uh, make them aware of the opportunities and their capabilities as a human being. Thank you. In, in the way I do it, uh, I have stopped worrying about others' mentality. I try to change my mentality first, uh, to do things in a way um, others don't think about that. So I do it, I don't feel uh, ashamed of it or uh, embarrassed because I'm doing something because I see that it's a, an opportunity to do that. Uh, we can, if you create a system, it changes the thinking process also. Like the women that I just mentioned that we have 8.3 million borrowers, 97% of them are women. They were not the one that, okay, give me the money, I'm going to go to business. <laughs> Jumping, no, they said, no, no, don't give the money to me. I don't know what to do with money. I'm afraid of money. Give the money to my husband. He's the one who handles money. That's our beginning point. But we didn't take that as a kind of her final answer. We said, this is a, when she speaks, she's speaking, he's, her history is speaking. She's not speaking. The way she was built, the way society has kind of squeezed her with all the worries, all the fears in life. So she's, talking through the layers and layers of veil of fear. So she cannot speak out. So I said, we have to remove those layers and layers of fear so that she can speak out and feel that I can do it. And it's the beginning. The beginning is always very small, always with one, always with two. If you can make two work differently, it will impact on 10. And the 10 are working, it will change 100. So we have to make a beginning. All those people that you said, we can create social business to get help them. I'm just giving the beggar story. Beggars are not the one, okay, I'm, I'll be business people. Suddenly it's just a little money. How much a loan is asked for by a beggar when she goes into a uh, business? Biggest amount she can think of is something like $15. And that's the biggest amount she could handle. And we give her a $15 loan. And she starts her business buying little things and carrying around and selling it, and they got excited. Now she's the one who's uh, selling Danone yogurt. Soon she will be selling this uh, uh, Adidas shoes, Reebok shoes, because she knows how to sell things. So I said, okay, this is a business for you too. So this becomes an income for her. Or uh, uh, BSF mosquito nets. She said, I'll sell mosquito nets if anybody is interested. So as I go from house to house, here is a mosquito net. Would you be interested? And she'll have a spill how to explain this mosquito net. That's it. So it's all possible. It's a question of how we design things, how we bring our creativity. We can work together and build some social business. Try it out. It's fun. 
<laughs> and we always say social business should be done with joy. So it's really fun to do that. Thank you. Yeah. I'm afraid you should time I'll just have uh, two more questions. I'm We're sorry. going a bit late, and that's wonderful because I think all of us are quite engaged. It's Saturday morning. We're not anywhere else to be anyway. <laughs> so uh, let's enjoy that, but uh, we'll have to end at a certain time because it's more homecoming activities. We'll have time for two more questions. Sure. Uh, Salam alaikum, Dr. Yunus. It Hi. is an honor to be in your Sorry. presence, especially after having been in Chittagong <laughs> when you won that award. Thank you. I was working for Young Power and Social Action, an NGO I'm sure you're familiar with. My question is, where does Grameen Bank get its capital from, especially pertaining to the educational funds? Yeah. Well, uh, the whole Grameen Bank is run with its own money. It doesn't come from outside. We don't take any money from the government or international agency or another bank or borrow or uh, get a grant, nothing. We, we entire money comes from our own, own system. It's, just, it's a bank. We take deposits. We t lend the money to the people who need it, uh, the uh, poor people. So uh, we have uh, more, than, more money than we need. Uh, sometimes it becomes a, quite a, uh, <laughs> a uh, problem for us, where do we invest our money, how to expand ourselves to get this money out so that people can use this money. Uh, so that's a happy situation. Uh, that's why I said uh, banks, sh there should be separate law for microcredits so that you can create a bank, microcredit bank. So don't have to worry about money coming from outside. Mm -hmm. And for microcredit, I always said, m for microcredit, money should not come from outside to begin with, and even for the NGOs. There should be local money. Because this is not, you don't need any hard money to uh, do business in the international arena. You, all you need is local money. So there should be local provisions of that money uh, if you're an NGO. But if you're a bank, you have plenty of money yourself. So education loan comes from our own money. Loan from the beggars comes from our own money. Uh, all the loans, the $100 million plus that we give out every, every month comes from our own money. And that money keeps growing and we keep on expanding that uh, business as we go along. Each branch, it's not only Grameen Bank as a whole, each branch is self-sufficient with its own money. A branch doesn't borrow money from the next branch. It's all their own money which lends out and, and become profitable mm -hmm. and give this profit. As the bank makes profit, profit goes back to the borrowers because they are the shareholders. They get the dividend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Professor good morning. Nunes. Um, I am working in social entrepreneurship and trying hard to make understand my colleagues in my school that this is a good way to, to go for work. And you were saying that mindset is a problem. And for me, the big problem is the, the, the mindset with money. Because for instance, when I get into social entrepreneurship, my parents was, what? You want to make money? My friends, well, social business. Then one wants to make money with the poor. Yeah. And so there are so social entrepreneurs that I have difficulties to understand how I can make money with social and big companies who want to help but people are telling them don't make money with poor. How do you explain to people that there is no crash between the two yeah. things? It's, it's a question of explaining uh, what the concept of social business, how it is done, what is the purpose. Uh, since it's a new concept, uh, still many people are not aware of it because it's not part of the textbooks. When it becomes a part of the textbooks, then everybody will learn there are two kinds of business in the world. One to make money, another to change the world. So you know what, how you change the world, how you make money for yourself. You can be both, you can make money in a money-making business, use the money in social business to change the world. So you design it, or you start designing social business yourself. Because to design social business, you don't have to go to a consulting firm to design me a social business. You can do it yourself. Your creativity is the one which is the most important thing in social business. And then along the way, we are also urging people to come up with funds, create social business funds. Many of these social business funds has already been created. I hope soon uh, Montreal will have its own social business fund or Canada will have its own social business fund. People will put together money to be invested you have a great idea, and this money will be invested in your great idea, so that that idea could be implemented. We have this social business fund already created, and we have been, I have been talking about Haiti for a long time, since the whole earthquake has begun. I said, many, many of this, much of this money will be wasted in Haiti, because Haiti doesn't have a structure to use this money, because everybody wanted to help Haiti and pour in lots of money, lots of resources, I said, why don't you use part of this money, say 10% of this money, put this into a social business fund. 
so that others can create social businesses to create employment, create uh, uh, transportation, uh, housing, uh, environmental programs, uh, all kinds of things as a social business. Uh, nursing colleges or uh, garment industry as a social business so that people have jobs, people have uh, things to do. Not for making money, but for uh, creating those uh, permanent um, uh, sustainable institutions. So now we have created that. Uh, social Business Fund for Haiti. And I'm very happy Inter-American Bank, the uh, bank for Latin America, the Development Bank for Latin America, uh, they came forward to create a social business fund in collaboration with us. So they will be putting a lot of money in that social business fund. I was told about $60 million in that social business fund for Haiti. So if you have a great idea for Haiti, come and t contact us. You have, we have the money ready for you. With pleasure. <laughs> yes, please. Anybody who has the great idea for Haiti, contact us. We'll make sure you get the funding, uh, investment from the uh, social business fund that we created. We'll be involved in that fund so that way we know. We want to create absolutely new way in Haiti so that young people get involved and create a completely new kind of country for themselves, have a beautiful green coverage. Today, Haiti has only 2% uh, forest coverage in the country. So we said we will change the whole thing as a social business. We can run this social business to create forests, create uh, mango orchards, uh, delicious foods, and all kinds of things can happen in Haiti. And that's what we are looking forward. All we need is technology. All we need is a great business idea how to solve it. Thank you. Thanks. Before we finish this morning, I'd like just to recognize and thank a few people that went into putting together this great event this morning. First of the BD a Memorial Lecture Committee, uh, chaired by Rima Rosa, who's our uh, Interim Vice Principal of Research and National Relations, for their sponsorship and organization of the event. Secondly, the World Platform, Professor Lorette Dubay for Health and Economic Convergence, the Faculty Management for bringing Dr. Eunice to McGill. Uh, there's a memory of uh, understanding being signed between McGill, Faculties of Management, Medicine, Dr. Eunice's organization, which uh, hopefully will help bring social business here to Montreal, Quebec, and Canada. The Homecoming Committee for their involvement in the organization, the Major, major BD Memorial Lecture. And finally, uh, Dr. Eunice, of course. You know, it's when you think about Dr. Eunice, very clearly a man that is very bright, a fine mind, a PhD from Vanderbilt but I think more a man with a great heart. As you think of the concern and the love, that's what moves you to think about what can we learn from Dr. Eunice today. That he has a great heart, that he has a positive view of human nature. Perhaps occasionally naive, but optimistic. <laughs> and 100 million people got help, so maybe not that naive after all. And it's something when we think about that, this is a great university at its best perhaps. The power of ideas, microcredit, social business, and the power of a courageous individual. But often you run into great people here from like Dr. Eunice. What struck me is that I can be a bit like him. I'm not sure I can be like President Obama or people like that of enormous stature. But the amazing thing, here's one of the world's great people, and I think you got that message as well, that I can learn from him and be a bit better person. And I particularly encourage my younger students, see some of them sitting here in the audience, to reflect this weekend. Put away the books. I'm not teaching, so I can say that this semester. <laughs> for an hour or so, put away the books and look up into space and just think about how will I make the world a bit better place? We've heard from someone who's done it. Let's you and I go out and do that. Thank you, Dr. Eunice. Thank you.